So without further ado, I'm going to give you my Melbourne story. It starts on a tram, funnily enough. On a hot February afternoon, a week or two after I'd first arrived in Melbourne, a stranger on the St Kilda Road tram spun me a yarn. He must have overheard me asking for directions as I bought a ticket from the conductor. He was certainly intrigued by my accent. You a Yank, he demanded from across the aisle, a man in his late 60s or early 70s. Beneath the broad brim of his felt hat, his eyes were lively, curious, and he was neat and trim in an R.M. Williams checked shirt. Despite the heat, he also wore a powder blue woolen vest, as if he were up from the country, dressed for town. Canadian, I said, and he apologized as if I might be insulted by his mistake. Then, feeling an obligation to make it up to me, he took the vacant seat beside mine and began to point out places of interest as we passed them. The last few remaining grand mansions of St Kilda, the War Memorial, Bluestone Army Barracks, the Botanical Gardens, the fish and chip water wall outside the National Gallery of Victoria. We trundled north, heat bouncing off the tram's wooden panels until the air seemed glazed. When we crossed Prince's Bridge, the Yarra River opened out beneath us. Sunshine glinted prettily on the water, the shoreline edged with boat sheds, a cafe, wharves, railway lines, and the squat brick bulk of Flinders Street Railway Station. Do you see that? My guide jabbed his finger at the window, his voice rising with excitement. What? I asked, scanning the scene for something historic or venerable. Flinders Street Station, he said, with triumph in his voice. She isn't meant to be there, you know. She was meant for Bombay. Someone in an office got the plans mixed up. She is in the wrong place. The sun in an unfamiliar position in the sky... Bright light splitting the day at an alien angle, the air hot and yellow when it should have been cold and grey, and all around me voices with such long nasal vowels every word sounded strange. <laughs> I turned to smile at my guide. I know exactly how that station feels. <laughs> I like the idea of a railway station lost in transit. It amuses me in the same way that naming a swimming pool after Harold Holt, the drowned Australian Prime Minister, does, or insisting that the eastern tip of busy Collins Street, with its skyscrapers and fast food outlets, is the Paris end. I can think of many novels and movies set in railway stations. After all, stories follow where people gather. But a story in which a railway station itself takes a journey is one to savour. It sticks in my mind, and I don't even care that it's unlikely to be true. I like the perversity of this, larn, of this yarn. A wandering railway station offers a scenic diversion from my daily mental landscape. A landmark in the wrong place easily becomes a landmark of the imagination. If you want to get there, don't be starting from here. When I let my mind drift as I travel on the 1059 from Clifton Hill, I get a little thrill as I pass through the dark brick tunnel that precedes Flinders Street Station's Platform 1. Is it possible, only just, that I might alight in Mumbai and not Melbourne? To wade in the Arabian Sea, eat an ice at the Breach Candy Swimming Club? My tour guide's finger jab not only at what we can see, but also at what might have been. His story was an invitation to see something more, to see double. Seeing double is something I know how to do. I was born in Burma, but grew up in Canada, emigrating with my parents when I was a young child. I have no memories of Asia, at least none based on my own sensory experience. But that land was as real to me as the blanket of snow in my backyard. Burma was conjured out of my parents' and grandmothers' voices, their whispered reports of scandalous behavior while we kids did the washing up, rollicking accounts of tiger hunts and midnight feasts torn from the pages of Kipling. Memories, too, of private railway carriages and tennis parties and snakes as thick as your arm. In an essay about writers and their families, the Irish novelist Colm Toybean reflects on how the desires and experiences of previous generations frame your own. He quotes Conor Cruz O'Brien, who describes this past within the present as a twilight zone of time, a period that stretches back for generations or for a generation or two before we were born and never quite belongs to the rest of history. This twilight zone is made up of the memories of parents and grandparents anecdotes told you by uncles and aunties and second cousins, stories that feel so comfortable, so lived in, that you come to possess them yourself, incorporating them into your own life. You learn the trick of inhabiting places you've never seen, but can summon up at will. You learn that the past, other people's pasts, may not belong to history, but instead belong to you. 
all those stories are yours to plunder. You can take them out, one at a time, and try them on as you might try on the clothes your parents have resigned to the dress-up box. There you are in the mirror, or someone very like you, the vegetal sense of long ago swirling about your ankles. My own family's stories and memories stretch backwards in time, across the Burmese military coup d'etat in 1962, Burmese independence, the Second World War, and colonial rule at its high point. They were not my memories, but were retold and retold so often that I was absorbed them, sucked them up whole. It felt like I'd lived them. Burma was important for me in another way as well. Out of all us kids, my two brothers and my sister, I was the only child born there. The city of my birth, Rangoon, featured prominently in my parents' tales. It was where they were married, where they had a big house with servants and an orange dog named after Mao Zedong. That dog used to guard, stand guard over my bassinet. He was loyal but fierce enough to frighten my mother. Mao was the pet we children longed for but never had growing up in Canada. I basked in the reflected glory of the city of my birth. It lent me a geographic prestige very helpful in the serious and cutthroat business of cultivating the interest of useful adults, like teachers or the parents of friends. I guarded Rangoon jealously, made it mine and mine alone, a city built on stories just for me, like an inappropriate birthday gift from a dotty old aunt or a curio handed down through the family, something to be taken out and marveled at in private, sinister and delicious, fragile and fantastic. When my guide on that tram pointed out the window to Flinders Street Station, I understood his excitement. I am well versed in seeing two places at once, west and east, new and old, bog ordinary and impossibly exotic. But double vision is also double-edged. When you see double, committing to one place isn't so easy. It is hard to focus. There is always the possibility of a life lived somewhere else. Once upon a time can spoil your here and now. I'll end it there. <laughs>